Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the first lecture of CO452, Programming Concepts. Now in this first lecture, we're going to take a look at the concepts of a class, an object, methods, variables, and also outputs. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now classes and objects are fundamental concepts of all object-oriented programming languages. Now in this module we're going to be looking at Java, but you can easily translate all of these concepts into languages such as C Sharp and C++. Okay, if you understand them here, you'll easily be able to uh, transfer them to those languages. So it's vital that we understand uh, these concepts. So let's talk about a class. Now we can liken a class to a blueprint. It's the blueprint from which objects are made from. So the class defines the design, the structure of the objects. If you think of building a house, first of all, we'd have a group of architects draw up the blueprint for the house. They do a floor plan and they design the, the room sizes, they put in the doorways, they put in the windows, they do that floor by floor to design the house before that design is then given to a load of builders who come in and build the house. Okay, And they're not limited to just building one house from that blueprint. They can go and build multiple houses from that blueprint. Maybe all the houses on the street from the same blueprint. Or indeed, whole houses, all the different houses in the region from that same blueprint. But the thing is, is that those objects are unique. Even if they look the same structurally, they've got the same number of doors and windows, they would at least have one unique feature. That is that they're all at a different address. They all have a different house number. So even if they've got the same color windows, the same color doors, you can tell them apart by the fact that they are different houses, they're in different locations, and they have different house numbers. Okay, so that's the thing with objects. We can create multiple objects, but even if they're the same structure, they have the same attributes to them, they are unique. Okay, take another example here. I've got some physical objects with me. So objects you might be familiar with, they are board pens, and notice that they are different. So they're two objects of the same entity. They're both pens, but they have unique features to them mainly their color, their size, and their shape, okay? So that's what we mean when we talk about classes and objects. Classes are the blueprint, objects, we call those the unique instances of a class, okay? And let's start by thinking about the two parts of a class. And the two key parts of a class are variables and methods. Now, unfortunately, these go by lots of different terms. So depending on which book you read, you may come across alternative terms such as data, fields, attributes. Those are all alternative names for variables, little storage areas that we create to store values corresponding to our objects, what we call state. Okay, We can change the state of an object by changing those values we store at variables. All right, and then likewise for methods, we have alternative terms such as functions, behaviors, and subroutines. So if you come across these terms, just remember that they refer to the two same parts of a class. All right, so in this lecture, we're going to unpack these two parts of a class, and we're going to start with variables. So what are variables? Well, variables, as we said, are storage areas for a single value. Now, they can only hold one value at a time. As the name implies variable, the, the value can change, just like a variable in a science experiment. We may update the value we store at a particular location uh, as we go throughout our programs, but it can only hold one value at a time. So. If we update it, we then overwrite the first value or the previous value that we uh, assigned to the variable. And these variables uh, come in lots of different formats. Uh, they can store different types of data from whole numbers, which we call integers, 
uh, decimal values, uh, small numbers, large numbers. We can store words, phrases, letters, uh, symbols, and the like. Okay, we'll have a look at uh, data types in just a second. And uh, these uh, types of data, what we call values, we store these values at a memory address. We allocate some memory from the RAM, typically, because we're only dealing with a small amount of memory. We're only storing a, a few bytes, typically, per, ver per variable. So we tend to use the RAM, which is temporary memory, rather than, say, committing to the hard drive. Uh, if we had a big database, we might want to commit that to a hard drive so we can come back to it uh, when we you know, close the program and open it up again later. But typically for uh, variables and values that just exist for the duration of the program, we don't need to commit these to hard drives, so we tend to store them temporarily on the RAM. And on the RAM, we give these, uh, these memory storage areas, we give them a memory address. And rather than us having to refer to this hexadecimal address every single time, we give variables a name, what we call an identifier, so that we can ref when, we, when we write that name in our programs, we tell the, the compiler to look at that memory address. Okay, the memory address stores the name, the memory address, and then it goes to it to get the value that we stored at that memory address. Okay, so let's have a look at how we can define our variables in code. And I say we're working with Java, um, but most of this can be applied to other languages as well. Um, there's a few uh, kind of unique attributes about Java, uh, which we'll get into throughout the course of this, uh, this module. But uh, the main two features of variables that we need to understand for, for any programming language, any strongly typed language, we should say, uh, are that we need to have two parts to a variable. We need to represent the type of data that we're going to be storing. So we need to choose from one of the data types, one of the primitive data types, or when we get to classes as well, you can uh, create a variable of a class type. That's what we call an object. Uh, but uh, for just a standard primitive variable, uh, we can choose from a series of data types, which we're going to have a look at, uh, to which represent the type of data we want to store there. And we're limited to storing values of that type. So if we pick one of the data types, like string, we can only store string values at that variable. So we have to specify what type of data we're storing, and then we have to give it a name, an identifier. Okay, so that's the two parts. And then typically to declare a variable, to define one, we then have the semicolon at the end. So that's uh, a feature of most strongly typed languages, uh, Java included, that we have to terminate the statement. So we'll see a lot of semicolons when we come to declare variables. Okay, so let's unpack the different types of data that we can represent. Uh, now, here we've just got a few of them. There are many more as well. And uh, here we've got integers. So this is represented as the keyword int. And uh, these store whole numbers. Okay, so we can't have any decimal points here. We just represent whole values. Um, and then we have, if we want to store decimal places, we have double data type. We can use that to represent you know, precise numbers if we have to have a, a certain number of decimal values. Maybe we're storing currency or uh, we'll being very precise with our values. We can represent uh, decimals through double. And then we have string. So as we mentioned before, this can store more than one letter. And there's something unique about string. You may see here that we've got a capital S, uh, whereas the others are lowercase letters for the start of the data types. And uh, this is significant because uppercase letters for the first letter of a word usually indicates a class. And indeed, that's the convention that we want to try and encourage uh, through writing our programs. We want to reserve uppercase letters, the first letter of a word, for representing a class. So here, string refers to a class. Uh, it's different from the other primitive data types that we see here. Okay. And then we have uh, characters. So these are abbreviated to chars, and these store a single letter, number, or symbol. All right. So unlike a string, which can store a whole phrase, and indeed we'll be using that to represent words and uh, phrases that we want to output to the screen, chars are just useful for storing single letters. 
okay? And then we've got Boolean, which is the smallest of the data types that just stores either true or false. Okay, there's only two options there. It can't be in between. It can only be true or false. And that's going to be useful when we come to look at uh, conditional statements. When we uh, want to execute a block of code, we have to first uh, check whether we should execute that block of code. You know, if a condition evaluates to true, then we want to execute it. We'll unpack that in another lecture. Okay, so that's our data type. As I say, we need to specify what type of data we want to store at a variable first of all, and then we need to give it an appropriate name. And I can't stress this enough. We need to select a meaningful name. That's going to represent the type of data that we want to store. If I want to store my name, then it would make sense to name the variable name. If I want to store my date of birth, it would make sense to call it date of birth. If I want to store an ID value, I'd call it ID. Um, Examples like that hopefully illustrate that it's not hard, it's common sense to pick meaningful names. Uh, just make sure that you do that, okay? And other rules and guidelines that we have to uh, follow here is that it's usually best practice to start with a letter. Uh, in some cases, some variables do start with an underscore. Uh, but typically, and most of the code we're going to have a look at here, we'll, we'll be starting with a letter. All right, so just remember that. Uh, also, we can't have spaces in the variable name. So if you come across a you know, very specific variable name, maybe something like first name or second name, middle name, last name, um, words, phrases like that, we can't have a space in between the two words, all right? Uh, Usually best practice, and indeed what we're encouraging here in this module, is to use camel case per the Java convention on naming. And the camel case is where you would make the second word, the, the first letter of the second word, uppercase. As you can hopefully see on the slide here, we've got uh, the first letter of case after camel is in uppercase which makes it a little bit more readable. Rather than the whole phrase being in lowercase, we can indicate the start of a new word by making the first letter of that new word uppercase. Okay, And uh, we'll see a bit later when we look at constants that we can also use the underscore. That's a typical convention to separate uh, words in constants. Also, for uh, our variable names, we can't use a reserve word. So words that already have a meaning to them, whether they're keywords or indeed other variable names uh, that have already been declared within a particular scope, we can't use those. Um, reserve words usually come up in a, in a color per what IDE you use. So we can't use uh, typical words that are, are in use. And then also beware of casing. So the final point to make here is uh, usually when we see uppercase letters, the, the entire word, the entire phrase in uppercase, that usually represents a constant. Okay, And hence, be better to avoid that for non-constants. Uh, storage areas like variables, better to put those in lowercase, uh, or as we, as we recommend, camel case, um, just so that we can distinguish between them. Because if in this case here, as you see in the slide, if we were to have two variable names called name, one in uppercase and one in lowercase, they would be treated as different variables. Even though they've got the same meaning, both refer to the word name, the compiler treats them as different storage locations. Okay. So in summary, those are the two things we need to remember with uh, creating variables. We need to indicate what type of data we want to store and select from one of the data types. And then we need to give it a meaningful name. Okay. One other thing uh, to mention here is that usually in terms of a, a class, when we, when we see variables declared within the scope of a class representing attributes of an object, uh, we may see keywords such as public and private in front of them. Okay, and just a quick, so, and this is, a, this is part of a object-oriented principle called encapsulation. And if we see the keyword public in front of a variable or a method declaration, then that means that this variable or method can be accessed, can be called or referred to outside of the class that it's defined in. Okay, but if it's declared to be private, uh, 
we see private in front of our variables, uh, which is a typical convention we're going to see in our Java code, um, this means that it can only be referred to within the class that it's defined in. Okay, and there is actually another encapsulation term, which is called protected. Uh, but we'll come on to this when we look at the concept of inheritance, which is another uh, object-oriented principle. Okay, so just bear that in mind uh, when uh, declaring variables and methods as part of a class. We'll see this as we get into code. Okay, and then next, another fundamental concept of variables is that we need to know how to assign values to our variables. So far, we've just looked at declaring them so that they are that a, a memory address has been allocated on the RAM, but now we want to go about actually storing a value there. And how we do that in code is we use the equals sign which in programming languages, that's referred to as the assignment operator. And what that does is that takes the value on the right-hand side of the statement. So if you have a look at the examples here, uh, we've got examples of values on the right-hand side of the equal sign. So values like Nick in speech marks, and then an integer value representing ID, and then the Boolean option, which is true. Those values would all be assigned to the storage area on the left-hand side of the equal sign. So where I've declared string name, I would store the value nick at that. Copies what's on the right-hand side into the storage area on the left. Same for ID. That integer value there, uh, the eight-digit ID value, would be stored at the storage area on the left, which is ID and the same for is complete, okay? It's different from maths, where you're trying to balance left-hand and right-hand sides of the equal sign. Here in programming, we say for the assignment operator, right-hand side is assigned to the left-hand side. Okay, so just remember that uh, there. Let's go on now and have a look at constants. And uh, constants are different from va variables because, as we said, variables, the value can change. It can vary throughout the course of the program. But constants have a consistent value. We can only assign one value at the start of the program, or typically when we declare the constant, which is at the start of uh, the, a particular class. So here, we can assign a value to a constant and you'll notice that we've got a keyword to represent that it's constant, which is final. Okay, you'll see that here. In, it comes before the data type, so we st like a variable, we still need to indicate what type of values we're going to be storing at our constant. Um, but we've got the keyword final in front of that, which means like the uh, term final does, it's final, it's finished, uh, there is no more. So that's end of. Um, so, this is the value that's going to stay constant throughout the course of our program. And you'll also notice here the naming convention, as we said earlier, our constants, we can tend to recognize them due to the uppercase uh, letters for the entire name of the constant. So here, like feet in miles, uh, we've also got underscores in there because Unlike camel casing, where you can tell the words apart uh, through the, the start of the first word is an uppercase. Because here in constants, every single letter is uppercase, it's easier to tell them apart with a underscore. Okay, so that's also another topic that we're going to be using and applying in our, in our programs because values that never change, uh, to prevent accidentally overwriting them later, we declare them to be constant. So hours in a day never changes, that's always 24, as does the maximum mark that you could achieve on a particular assignment, and also feet in miles. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our section on variables. That's the first part of a class. So variables tend to be declared at the top of classes. And then underneath variables, we have a series of methods. Okay, that's the second part of a class. So, so what are methods? Well, they're blocks of code that represent a single operation or behavior. And it's important to stress that. The best way to declare methods, best practice, is to write methods that perform one operation only. 
he, uh, he don't, we want, what we want to do is we want to break up our series of operations into dedicated blocks of code so that when we execute one block of code, that fulfills a single operation, just so that we don't accidentally start doing other operations that we didn't intend to. Allows us to be a lot more modular in our programming. And it's worth saying that these blocks of code, uh, they may contain one line of code. We're going to see that with our setters and our getter methods when we have a look at those. But uh, more complex methods, which require more statements to achieve a particular operation, will have more than one line of code. Okay, And uh, we execute that block of code when we call the method. That's when we write the name of the method. And with object orientation, we usually have to have an object in front of that. So we need to call a method on an object. Uh, you'll see that when we start looking at BlueJ. Okay, and it's also possible to pass data into our methods. So we can pass values into our methods. And we can also return a value from a method. Okay, so let's have a look at how we could declare one. Uh, here we see just an example. It's just a generic name called method name. And you'll notice above that we've also got a comment. And uh, again, this is good practice to have comments that describe what a given method does. Uh, you'll see this more and more as we get into the module. Um, but under, if you have a look at the signature of the method, notice there we have declared it to be of public scope so that we can call this method from outside of the class that it's defined in. This is going to be important when we create objects of our classes so that we can actually call the methods on them. And then you notice there we've got a return value which is void. Like the typical definition for void means null, or a voided transaction means it's a, a nullified transaction, nothing, empty. Um, a void means that no value is going to be returned from this method. Okay, if we did want to return something, we'll have a look at an example of that in a, a few slides' time where we change the return value. But then after the return value, if we're not returning anything, just write void there. And then uh, we have a method name. So think back to the good practice principles of, declaring, of writing our variable names. We want to apply those same principles here with method names. It's good to apply camel casing. Uh, if we want to be very specific with our method name, if we can have more than one word in it, we'll use camel casing. And uh, we also want to describe what we are doing. And because it's an action, because it's a, a task, an, an operation, a behavior, it's doing something, these tend to be verbs like get or set or add or print or do. Um, words that are verbs, they do something, okay, as opposed to variable names, which are nouns, they describe something. All right. And then after the method name, you notice there we've got a pair of curly brackets. And we call these parentheses. And uh, here in this example, we have got an empty pair of parentheses. We're not passing any data into our method. Uh, but again, we could do this. We could um, uh, de declare a variable within our parentheses to store a value that we want to pass in. We're going to have a look at that very soon. All right, and then that's the si so that's the signature of the method name. Then underneath that, you notice we've got a pair of squiggly brackets, um, which are we call these braces in uh, programming terms. And then within those braces is where we write the statements, the the code that we want to execute when we call this method. Remember, we call methods on an object that we declare of a class. And uh, we would refer to the method name to call the code within it. OK, so let's move on here. And let's have a look at how we can now pass data into our method. As we hinted at uh, just a few minutes ago, we can declare a variable within the context of the parentheses here. So notice, uh, still got public void. And then I've, I've chosen to call this uh, method here set name. So as the name implies, it's going to set the value for the name attribute. So therefore, I can pass in the value for name to then assign to the name attributes of my object of this class. So in order to capture that information, I need to set up a variable that's going to be local to this method, it should be, should be said, because it's declared within the parentheses of that method. If you have a look here, we see string name. 
That then stores the value that I put within the parentheses when I come to call the method on an object. So that value is passed in, it's stored temporarily in the name variable that is declared within the parentheses here. And then you notice here on the statement that's within the braces of this method, where it says this dot name equals name, the name on the right hand side here, the emboldened version of name, is the same name variable that I declared in the parentheses. So the value that I copied into name is now going to be assigned to the name attribute, which is on the left hand side of the assignment operator, the equals sign. And uh, we'll come back to this, there's a, a slide on that. Um, but the name here is just refer the, the left hand side name is referring to an attribute of this object that would have been declared above this method. Before we look at this though, let's just quickly look at returning data from a method. So we've previous slide we had a look at passing data into our method. Now let's have a look at how we can get data from and out of our methods. So here we've got an example of a getter method which will return the value of an attribute of the class. So notice now, rather than void, rather than public void, I've got public string. I've changed that return value from void, meaning that it's not going to return in the think, but because I've got a return statement in the block of code here, you can tell by the keyword return, I need to change that return value in the signature to represent the type of data that I'm going to return. And in here, and in this case, because I'm returning the name, which is a string value, it's like Nick, or Sam, or Derek, Emily, Laura, um, that needs to be changed to string to, rep to match the type of data that I'm returning. Okay, and then within the method, I then want to have the return statement followed by a particular value that I want to return. In this case, it's a string value. It's the value of the attribute name, the variable that was declared at the top of my class. Okay, so now let's have a look at the keyword this because um, we've glanced over it, but it's important that we cover it um, because this is a very important feature of our classes. This can be substituted for any given object of a class. Rather than hard coding a specific object name, uh, let's think of an example, maybe if I had a student class and I created lots of different student objects, rather than hard coding in one of those object names to ref in, in my methods, every time I, if I was to do that, every time I'd call this method, I would only ever get the attributes of that one method. So what I really need is a placeholder that can then be substituted for any given object that I call this method on, okay? And that's what the keyword this does, okay? It can be substituted for whether I have an object called Nick or an object called Derek, an object called Sam, an object called Emily, an object called Laura. Any given object of this class can be substituted here to get specifically the information for that object. Okay, and you're gonna see this when we come to look at the constructor as well, which I think is our next slide. Yes, it is. So the constructor is a very important, uh, very important method of a class. Okay, and that's the first thing to mention about it. It's a special class that has, uh, sorry, a special method which has the same name as the class. Okay, and uh, because the class has an uppercase letter to start, so will the constructor. Okay, the constructor is also unique in that it doesn't have a return type. So we usually see public and then the constructor name, which is the same name as the class, all right? And this constructor is called when we create an object of our class. When we have a look at the object creation syntax, you'll see that. Uh, when we do that. So what we can do is we can define a method that has the same name as the class. As you see here, the embolden code on this slide, uh, notice here the class is called house, we see right at the very top. And uh, then we, got, you, we open the braces for the class, so all the code that's placed within here is going to be of this class scope. It belongs to this class. So the first thing we see is private int number, semicolon. Now, hopefully remember this is a variable. 
variables what we declare right at the top of the class. And then underneath that, we have got two methods. The first method is the constructor because we've got the method name, which is the same as the class name, which is house. Okay, notice there, uppercase H to start house. Also got no return type, so there's nothing in between public and house. If you glance down to get number, you'll see we've got public int, referring int meaning the return value. That refers to the value that we're returning, which in this case is the number, the attribute number. Okay, so back to our constructor, public house, and then in this case, we are passing in the house number when we declare the object. So you'll see this in just a moment when we have a look at the object syntax. But like our setters, we're passing in a value which is stored temporarily in the number variable that's declared within the parentheses here, within the curly brackets. And then what we're doing is we are assigning that value we passed in to the number variable that corresponds to the class. And notice there we are saying this dot number meaning that we can be precise there. We can refer to the number that belongs to the class rather than the number that was declared in the parentheses. It's a way of differentiating between the two. Okay, So that's what the constructor does. It usually assigns, usually initializes values. Sorry, it usually, usually initializes our variables, assigns the values to the variables of our class. Okay. So that's what our constructor does. And then coming down, the very last method of this particular class uh, declaration is the get number method. It's a getter method. You can tell it by the name, get, get number, return number. So there we see public int get number, and then uh, we return an integer value, which is the number variable, the number attribute for a given object. So that's one half of the, uh, the equation. That's creating our classes. The blueprint, if you remember right back to the start of this lecture, we create a blueprint from which we can instantiate, so we can create instances of, and those are our objects. So let's have a look at creating an object of a class. Now, like a variable, Remember, we had two parts to the variable declaration. We have to specify what type of data we want to store and then give it a meaningful name. We've got that here, but rather than referring to a primitive type, we've got the class name. So we're saying we want to create a variable of this class structure, which is house. That's our class declaration. Okay, so we refer to the first, the very first thing we see here is the class name. That's the type for our variable. And then we see lowercase h house, which is our object. So it's class name and then object name there, just like we would with variables. We have our type and then our identifier for our variable. But then we've got new syntax because we've got then, after our object name, we've got Simon operator and then the keyword new. Now, the keyword new uh, will is... We'll, you'll probably unpack this later in, in other modules, but uh, just to give you a brief summary, keyword new, uh, because we objects tend to store more data than primitive values, we need a larger, not, not colossally large, but we need a, you know, more memory to store all of this data. So the new keyword tells the compiler to allocate memory from the heap rather than the stack. Okay, that's the difference here. So we just, all we really need to know uh, we're not really going to cover pointers in this module. That will be done in other modules. But really, anything you need to remember here is that we need to write the keyword new. And then after that, we need to specify, uh, we need to actually call something, don't we? And notice here, we've got parentheses. So that indicates we're calling a method. And notice the name of the method. It's got the same name as the class. You see the uppercase H there. So a method with the same name as the class is the constructor. Okay. So like we said, it's the first method that's called when we create the object. And we've got the explicit call to it here. Okay. We are writing it. We are calling the constructor because we've got the parentheses. And then within those parentheses, we have a integer value. 5. And remember that 5 is going to be passed into the constructor at the class declaration end here. So stored in number. 
And then that number is then assigned to the attribute number, the variable number for the house object. Okay, so that when I call get number the method on the next line now, we also have to have a semicolon, by the way, in the previous line. Uh, when we're calling a method, we need to terminate that with a semicolon. But coming down to the line underneath our object declaration, we then call the get number method. Notice there again, it's a method because it's got a pair of parentheses. We haven't put anything in that this time because we're not expecting anything to be stored. Notice on this slide now, going back to it, uh, we've got no variable declared in get number, this, the, the parentheses there. So we can call it without passing a value in. But when we call it, we call it on the house object, which we declared in the statement above. Okay, so if we were running this in BlueJ, we would see the value five in a little pop-up menu, little pop-up screen. Okay, it just returns the value that we set in the previous uh, statement. Okay, and then just to uh, give you another example, what we could do is that we can then create another object of the house class. So we've got the same syntax again. If I wanted to represent a mansion this time, uh, I could create a variable of the house type. So we have the class name and then the object name. So mansion is the object name and house is the class. And then we say assignment operator new, get some memory from the heap, enough memory to store all the different data associated with the object. And then we call the constructor passing in one that's set as the number attribute for the mansion, which is different to the number attribute of the house, the object house. So that when we call get number on the mansion, we then see one on the pop-up menu rather than five. I've got two different objects of this house structure. They're both houses, both of the type a house, entity house, but they are unique objects. So I can, I can create more houses from this structure and give them unique features. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Let's now finish up this presentation by talking about outputs. So uh, in BlueJ, as I mentioned, if you'd have done the if you'd executed the statements on the previous slide, you would have seen a little pop-up menu, uh, which is unique to BlueJ. Uh, when we look at other IDEs, we would have to invoke another command to actually see data on the console. Okay, so let's talk about the print and print line methods. Uh, now, if we wanted to print data to the screen, we have to invoke the print or print line methods, and these exist within another class library. We have here system.out.print. So notice that dot notation again. We're saying, we're referring to print, which, which exists within out, which exists within system. We can tell system's a class because it's got an uppercase S there. Okay, um, so that's how we get to it. And then like all methods, we have a pair of parentheses and what we put within the parentheses will be printed to screen. So here you see a string literal, uh, just a, a message here really, just saying the house number. Uh, and then underneath we've got another print command, calling it again, but this time passing it number. And let's say that was the number attribute. So we should see the house number there. And because we're using the print method here, we're printing on the same line. Okay, so we should see house number. And then we've got a white space there uh, just before that last speech mark. And that's how we indicate strings, by the way, uh, string values. Uh, we, have, we enclose that, uh, those words within a pair of speech marks. And then after that, we would see the number printed on that same line. Okay, so we could have any number of print method calls uh, on different lines in our method, one after each other, underneath each other, but they would all be printed out on the same line when we come to run this method, which is called print. Okay, so if we this was part of a class and we call print, uh, we would see this data printed to the screen. Okay, but if you have a look at the next slide here, we've got another example where we are calling print line, or to be more precise, print ln. You notice there, there's no i and there's no e. It's abbreviated to ln. And what this can do is this will print out all of the data that's within the parentheses on the same line, 
and then include a, uh, a new line at the end so that the cursor would then go down to the next line uh, when it's finished printing out the data that's in the parentheses here. And there's one other thing to mention, because you'll notice here we've got one statement now rather than two, and, we are, and we've got a plus sign in between our string literal, house number, and the attribute, the variable called number. Okay, so rather than adding these two things together numerically, which we can't do because uh, house number is a string, it's not an integer or a, or a, a number type, what we're doing here is we're actually overloading. That's a, a fancy word for saying we're giving a different meaning to this operator. Um, what we're doing is we're actually joining these two pieces of data together. We are concatenating is the technical word. We are joining these two bits of data. We've got a string uh, piece of data and we've got a integer piece of data and we are combining them together as an output. Okay, we're not adding them numerically uh, obviously, if you use the plus sign with two integer values, uh, you would add them together numerically. But here, with a string and with an integer, we are joining them together to print them out to screen. Okay, and that's how we can join the, the values that we store in our attributes together with other types of um, messages and phrases just to indicate and give meaning for our values stored in our objects. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the presentation. I hope that was beneficial for you. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.